Hi everyone, we're Plastronics, um, and we're creating a thrombone resistant coating for intravascular medical devices. I'm Rita Derry, and I'm the CEO. I'm Nicholas Leonard, and I'm the CFO. I'm Darren Pansky, I'm the CTO. I'm Clark Lucart, and I'm the COO. So, just a little bit about. Well, I'll give you an agenda. Our agenda is going to start off with an introduction, um, and then we're going to have Dan, who's going to give you a process um, overview, and then Nick will give you, um, talk to you about the economics, and then we'll go into safety, and then talk about um, our future of where we'll be. So, a little bit about intravascular medical devices. They're found throughout the body, um, anywhere from your coronary to your peripherals, or even the neurovascular or structural heart. And so this can be anything from an IVC filter to a stent. And a lot of times these medical devices are crucial for survival. And just a look at the market for intravascular medical devices. It's already a pretty large market at roughly $63 billion. And it's expected to grow to about $116 billion a year by 2022. Um, so why are we here today? So the issue with um, that can occur with intravascular medical devices is that when they're going to the body, they're acting as an artificial surface. And so an artificial surface can cause blood clots to form on this device. And so something that's going in to solve a crucial issue can also cause another issue. And so roughly 350 to 600,000 people a year are affected by blood clots. And from that number, um, about 100 to 180,000 will die from pulmonary embolism, which um, besides just dying from it, you can also cause a stroke. So two um, pretty uh, major issues with blood clots. And as the market continues to grow um, with these intravascular medical devices, if this issue doesn't get solved, you know, we're just gonna, the numbers are just going to keep increasing. So a little bit more about our company. We're located in Orange County, California which is um, the largest market for medical devices. And um, our vision and mission is to eliminate blood clot formation on um, intravascular medical devices and try to um, eliminate the um, amount of deaths from PE. So our product is going to um, be a coated medical device that prevents the formation of blood clots. So the way we're going to do this is by producing a coating that um, is made out of plasmin. And the reason for plasmin is because it's a natural enzyme found in the blood that, um, found in our body, sorry, that breaks up blood clots. So by producing this coating, we would then coat medical devices and um, eliminate blood clots from forming on those surfaces. So a look at our, com a look at our competitors. Um, the Weiss Institute in Harvard is um, working on a polymer medical device um, coding in which they've had 20 FDA approved um, devices. They focus more on um, like syringes or tubing and the difference between the Weiss Institute and um, Plastronics is that they're focusing on polymers and they're also um, not focusing on plasmid immobilization. And the reason why we want plasmid immobilization is because um, it's proven to um, have uh, longer effects in the body. Um, and so another reason why um, Plastronics differs from um, the Weiss Institute is like I mentioned, the Weiss Institute is focusing on polymers. But if you look at the metallic uh, biomaterials are the preferred um, biomaterial in comparison to ceramics and polymers. And by 2022, it's going to continue to increase and be the more preferred uh, material. And not only is it 60% of the medical devices used by uh, materials, um, biomaterials such as stainless steel are um, shown to be less corrosive, um, toxic, and um, prevent generation of debris by wear. And this is really important when you have these medical devices um, you know, inside your body. So, like I mentioned, our target is um, you know the U.S. market is going to be around 116 billion by 2022. Um, you know we're located in Orange County, um, which is you know one of the lar the largest market for medical devices, which would help us out in that aspect. And stainless steel um, based medical devices take up 60% of the market, 
and the average cost for an implantable uh, medical device is roughly $3,000, and the number of devices we're looking to cope is $5.46 million a year. Uh, so just talk a little bit about process design. Um, our entire process between coding, um, making the plasma and whatnot, um, there's a lot of different unit operations that go into it. Um, just our bioprocessing side of things has about uh, 40 unit ops. Um, so we're going to try and talk on a high level and focus on the more key aspects of this. So as a process overview um, and how we're going to go from making the plasmin to actually coating it, um, we start off with a fermentation process where we're actually going to ferment um, in a 50,000 liter uh, fer uh, fermenter. Um, and we're going to actually grow our cells, or E. coli, um, and from that we're going to extract the, um, the plasmin, or the plasminogen, the inactive form of plasmin. And then from there, we have to crack open the cells, get you know, the good stuff inside of it, um, and we go through a few more phases, IB solubilization, uh, enzyme refolding, enzyme conversion. Essentially, we have to solvate the actual enzymes that are in there um, for us to be able to use them. Um, and then we go to more uh, uh, downstream purification, where we extract the enzyme, um, and then surface activation of the medical devices, and then we can incubate, where we actually covalently link them to the surface of the medical devices. Um, so this is our kind of proof of concept um, of our fermentation model. Um, so for the fermentation model, uh, you know, Aspen Plus wasn't really able to you know, do a lot of this stuff, so we actually did this by hand, um, and with the help of Python. Um, so we were able to take material balances on the entire system in the fermenter. Um, we looked at biomass, uh, we took a, 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 um, a material balance on the substrate, and we took a material balance on the product. Um, and so what we found here um, was a system of differential equations that we can plug into Python um, and solve over time to look at our growth of this biomass, our consumption of the substrate, and our consumption um, and our production of our actually uh, product, the plasminogen. Um, it's important here too, uh, we used a uh, substrate limited growth model. We assumed that glucose was a limiting um, substrate. Um, we could have gone with other things like oxygen and whatnot. Um, in some of the bigger scale fermenters, it's really difficult to get um, enough oxygen supplied to your cells. Um, but we assumed that um, with enough sparging, we'd be able to get that oxygen demand. Um, and so the next few steps in the process are the homogenization, um, the I inclusion body solubilization, and the protein refolding. Um, so what happens after we ferment um, is we have to you know, homogenize the cells. So how we do that is we looked at a, a few different ways to do this. Um, we could have gone uh, with either um, some sonification and whatnot. Um, we decided it's a larger scale process to go for a single pass high pressure homogenizer unit. Um, and we also combined some chemical reagents. Um, we use EDTA. Um, and Triton X100, which are uh, two surfactants, which kind of break up the uh, cell membranes. Um, and once we crack them open and get what's inside, the big issue for our process is these things called inclusion bodies. When you're um, producing these, when these cells are producing these enzymes at such a high rate, um, what actually happens is the proteins aren't allowed to the proteins aren't allowed to actually fold correctly, and so they're not actually solvated in the solution. So they uh, they aggregate. Um, and they cause these, you know, insoluble um, pieces, which you can see uh, inside these cells. So what we have to do is, it sounds kind of counterintuitive, but you have to denature the enzymes first um, so that they all break up. So how we do that um, is we add some urea um, and some beta-mercaptanol beta -mercaptanol, um, to break up those intermolecular uh, um, forces and then so they can solvate. Um, and then from there, uh, we go through a diafiltration step with a TFF filter um, to kind of remove a lot of those denaturants over time. Um, and then we let it sit and we let it refold. Um, take, that process takes about 24 hours. Um, and then once we have uh, you know, the folded uh, zymogen of the plasminogen, we actually have to activate it. Um, so plasminogen is not the active form of plasmin. There's actually um, so co some covalent modification that takes place after the processing. Um, so you have to actually cleave part of the plasmin, um, a plasminogen, by another enzyme called urokinase um, that's secreted by the kidney, which is a much easier process to extract. Um, and then from there, 
um, once you actually cleave it to the bioactive form of plasmin, um, we can use affinity chromatography. And what the affinity chromatography does is it binds selectively to the, uh, to the cystines in the um, plasmin, so then we can separate out of the solution. Um, and then from there, uh, the last step of the bioprocessing is to lyophilize it um, into a powder form for use in the incubation process. Um, and so once we have our enzyme or bioactive plasmin, um, from there we actually want to then adhere it to the surface of our medical devices. And so the way we do that is once we get the medical devices from our companies, we, use, uh, a, we work with a CMO, we send it out to a CMO where they actually run a chemical vapor deposition process. And by that, they functionalize the surface of these medical devices. Um, and by them functionalizing these surfaces, we can then adhere the plasmin to the surface of these devices. Um, so what happens here is if you take this uh, orange square to be the medical device, once, that devi once that's um, um, functionalized, we can then incubate it with a solution of plasmin dissolved in PBS at uh, 30 degrees Celsius, um, and then we can adhere the enzyme and immobilize it to that medical device. Um, so just uh, overall process summary, um, what's kind of going on here. Um, the whole bioprocessing side of things, we make about 17.22 uh, kilograms produced per batch. <coughs> um, right now we're looking to potentially uh, run at one batch a month because um, it's such a long process. You have the fermentation, which takes a while, um, all the purification steps. Um, and then this is our final uh, product stream. Um, we're able to produce that in roughly 97% purity. Um, and then once we have all the incubation batches, we can actually, we need to coat roughly 70,000 medical devices um, per, uh, we can do that per batch um, to meet, with our, meet up with our market demand. So with those numbers, um, the bioprocessing side of things produces enough plasmin for the incubation step to actually coat these medical devices. Right, so I'm gonna take care of the process safety and control. We took our entire system and conducted an FMEA to analyze the failure modes and uh, associate risk priority numbers, RPNs, to each of our unit operations. And so because we have so many different unit operations going on, we chose to highlight the top three RPN uh, associated with each unit operation. And the first that we'll go over is the heat sterilization. Now, this is used to sterilize the media going into the fermenter. And it's operating at 140 degrees C. The only unit operation to operate at greater than 37 degrees C and our overall process is designed to handle that temperature. However, if it were to operate at a uh, larger temperature for an uh, extended amount of time, our process isn't designed to do that, and we would foresee equipment breaking and you know, leakage occurring and the loss of our batch, which would be a great detriment of time, money, and energy lost. And to accommodate and prevent that from happening, we've included a temperature control system on the inlet to the heat sterilization to control the steam going in at 140 degrees C and prevent and alarm anybody for if it were to be outside of a standard operating range, as well as inclusion of drains around the system. Uh, should any leakage occur, they can uh, drain away safely. Um, our next system that we're gonna talk about is a fermentation vessel. Uh, and the, this is where all our cell growth is happening. This is where um, the, the bulk of our process uh, is reliant on. And the two large hazards associated with the fermentation vessel, like I mentioned, was heat um, overheating from the heat sterilization unit as well as overpressurizing from our centrifugal compression unit that also feeds into this. The centrifugal compression unit, just a quick background on that, is providing oxygen and nitrogen to the cells inside the fermentation vessel, uh, allowing them to grow at an optimal rate. Um, however, if there's too much uh, vapors flowing into the fermentation, it can overpressurize. To accommodate for that, we have a pressure control system associated with uh, a ventilation valve in order for uh, 
the, the vent, ventilation of the carbon dioxide that's produced as well as any unused uh, vapors. And that's delivered to a biosafety vessel uh, where it can be further disposed uh, to accommodate for the overheating from the uh, heat sterilization. There's a jacket, a cooling jacket on the system and a temperature control system uh, associated with the inlet of that jacket to further mediate the flow rates into the jacket and control and maintain the uh, vessel at the 37 degrees C operating temperature. Um, to accommodate any of the hazards, should they go and uh, destroy the batch, we have uh, drains on the floors as well as uh, insulation on the heated parts of the system flowing into and um, controls to make sure that everything goes right. Uh, the next vessel that I, or unit that I'd like to talk about is the homogenization unit. Uh, this is, you know, making sure that our cell concentration is uniform throughout the system and ultimately providing a uh, really key instrument in the final yield of our uh, cell production and it's operating, it needs to operate at a concentration of 100 grams per liter of the uh, cells flowing through. Uh, greater or lesser concentrations will cause either the pump to cavitate or the homogenizer to overwork and uh, ultimately rupture and break. If these were to happen, there would be you know, leaks going uh, onto the plant floor as well as our, the loss of our batch and uh, production and therefore the loss of lots of time, money, and energy. Uh, to prevent this from happening, we have a concentration control system um, at the inlet of the homogenizer and uh, that will ensure that if it's operating at a concentration outside of uh, the 100 degree, 100 grams per liter for too long, it'll shut the pump off and prevent any uh, destruction of our equipment and uh, preserve uh, what we have of the batch um, to fix whatever's going on and then restart back up. And moving on to our chemical safety. These are some of the more common chemicals that we are using in our process. The, they're all corrosive and or irritants. The, the most dangerous chemical that we're using is the beta mercaptan ethanol to denature our proteins. Now, this is a strong, strong chemical that is also capable of denaturing uh, human proteins and uh, should it enter the system and ultimately can lead to death. Uh, so we're going to have all of our uh, employees properly equipped with um, safety equipment and uh, respirators and everything to prevent any sort of uh, violation of their safety and as well as by the time it flows through our system it's going to be uh, properly diluted so when, uh, it, when it comes to disposal and uh, containment it will be a much lesser threat than it would be in its pure form. And overall a summary of our system the FMEA that we conducted reveals that our uh, process was of generally low hazards. Um, our operating temperatures and such were only mostly at 37 degrees C um, and that we would be in compliance with OSHA standards and FDA standards. Uh, we're administering lockout tagout procedures for the startup of and maintenance of our process uh, annually and uh, regularly, as well as we'll be contacting local authorities to make sure that they are aware of our um, process operation times and uh, our plants emergency responses. All right, let's talk money. <laughs> All right, so looking at our raw material costs annually, they sum to about 4.1 million, with the largest contributors being the chromatography resin, the urokinase enzyme, uh, the glucose for the fermentation step, 
and phosphate buffer solution for the incubation setup. Now looking at our initial equipment costs, this is a little bit heftier at 23.8 million. And the largest contributors here would be the freeze drives or the lyophilization units and the PVA chromatography columns since there are five different uh, columns within that unit. And the rest is mostly just filters, centrifuges, and reactor vessels. So I'm looking at our capital costs as part of the initial investment. We broke it into our plant direct cost, our indirect cost, and then our contractors and contingency fees. And plant direct costs include the equipment costs and other things like piping, insulation, things you know associated with physically constructing the plant. And then indirect costs would be things like yard improvement, engineering fees for the short term. And then the contractors would just be any person who's hired just for the construction of our plant, not full-time employees. So this adds up to 172.1 million. So then we look at our production costs on an annual basis. So the main types of labor we looked into would be operators and process engineers. And we decided to split our overall process into three main steps. One would be the upstream um, plasma production process, another would be the downstream, and then the incubation process. We decided to hire six operators, two serving at each step, and then three process engineers where one is in charge of each step as well. Now our utilities, we tried to be as efficient as possible in our production which leads to a total of you know, only 11.7 thousand annually. We use fairly low um, electricity, cooling water, steam, um, glycol, all that. And our waste production is actually pretty low as well. We only have two main types of waste, both in aqueous form. So those are fairly easy to dispose of, which is very inexpensive. And on a mass basis, it's about 16% waste given the amount of raw material we put into our process. Now this last item at the bottom here, that's our contractor's fee for the chemical vapor deposition process, which is a lion's share of our production costs. Now we contracted a company called Et Ultramet to do our CBD process, and they gave us a very rough estimate of about 9.1 million annually, given the amount of device we're coding and our specific process needs, but we decided to have a conservative estimate of 10 million. So how do we get together our total investment? It's all our capital costs, and then one year of raw materials and one year production costs to actually get our first round of product out there. And this adds up to 186.8 million. So for our revenue streams, we have two main revenue streams. So our main principal stream would be coding the medical devices that we've been talking about this whole time. Now the current market for medical device coatings is about $11.8 billion annually. And since we're looking at Orange County, and stainless steel um, based materials only. We estimate that the average price we'll charge for to coat these medical devices would be about $305. Now given that the average stent is about $3,000 to purchase from the manufacturer, this is only about a 10% increase in the total cost. So we believe that will help make us competitive in the market. So all in all that revenue stream leads to about 1.66 billion annually. Now for our other uh, revenue stream. So yes, we only really need 74 kilograms of plasma to coat all these devices. But we anticipate growing, you know, within the U.S. and globally. So we design our plant to incorporate and upscale in the process. So currently, if we're doing 12 batches a year, one every month, we're going to have about 130 kilograms of excess plasma produced. Now this is highly valuable on the market now, since it's sold by the milligram or even by like couple hundred micrograms at $72 a milligram. So in order for us to be really competitive, we're going to apply a 75% wholesale discount since we're selling kilograms worth of this. So all in all, that revenue stream will actually bring in a little bit more at $2.3 billion. So combining these two together, we can accept a total revenue of $4 billion annually. So of course, we have expenses to pay as well, so where is all this revenue going? So. All our raw material and production costs actually make up a very small fragment of the distribution. I don't know if you can see that little red sliver there, but that's our actual production cost. And we did research into what typical pharmaceutical and biotech companies actually spend all the revenue on. And the majority of it goes to marketing and further research and development. And then this other miscellaneous category that includes things like insurance, it's a huge liability, you know, working with medical devices. 
administrative costs, and then packaging and distribution. For our packaging, since these have to be sterile GMP certified, we're partnering with DuPont's Tyvek division in order to make sure that our coated devices meet these high standards. And for distribution, we're partnering with FedEx to um, handle all our distribution needs. Now, the last chunk with this turquoise and blue section, that's our taxable income. So 21% of that will go to the federal government, and then 8.84 will go to the state of California. So let's look at our profits over 10 years. So like I mentioned with the taxable income, it's a factor of revenue, expenses, and depreciation charges. We chose to go with an eight-year depreciation plan since we wanted to look at uh, the profitability of our company over the first 10 years. So looking at this graph here, year zero and one, that is when our plan is in the construction phase in the first year of operation. So we're not actually pulling any revenue in there, which is why it's at the bottom. But as you can see from year two on, we sort of plateau out at about 275 million in profit annually. So putting together profits and the time value of money since unfortunately inflation is a thing, so money becomes less valuable over time. We combine these two together to give a return on investment of 66.3% over a 10 year span, which we believe is very feasible and proud. So looking forward, what can we do in the future? We want to do a little bit of mobilization stability testing just to improve the quality control of our coding. Um, we want to do a little bit more modeling on the chromatography column just to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of it. And we'd like to do more research into chemical vapor deposition technology so that way we can do that in-house instead of having to contract it out every year. And of course, safety, we can always improve upon that. But take a look into there. And then, like I mentioned earlier, we do look to expand into the US and global market both in our coding business and our plasma and sale business. So we just like to make a few acknowledgements here. Our professor Fluger for guiding us through this whole process over the past few months. Our mentor Judy Baudet has been a great help along the way. Uh, Richard LaRoche, which is a colleague of Judy's who helped us with you know, understanding a little bit of the computational you know, biologic processing. And Professor Hong, who gave us all the economic insights from Capstone One and Ultramed Advanced Technologies for giving us a little bit of information about you know, contracting out a CBD process. So, any questions? Um, I included a lot of the, I know I didn't want to talk too much about the PND because there's a lot involved in it, but I just I wanted to include those and just show those too, um, that, we, that we had them in there. Um, yeah. Okay, you have them there. Yeah. They're there. Um, so ideally, I mean, for the most part, they are produced like kind of denatured to begin with. Okay. Um, a lot of the literature, I mean, that was something I had a question on too, um, and there is a lot of good literature out there, um, bench scale of people, you know, trying to, you know, isolate plasma and create it. Um, and they were saying for the most part that you don't lose any. Um, if you if you don't actually do the denaturing step, um, you're actually going to lose it because they say about like 20% is properly folded, is not in an inclusion body, but the other 80% or so is stuck in that inclusion body. And you can't do anything with that until you actually break up those inclusion bodies. Um, so you, you end up getting, you know, roughly like close to 100% yield of those guys. Um, I may have just missed this, but is plasminogen like naturally occurring in mm -hmm. So we actually the way the way we do this is we can include an expression vector okay. um, into the into the uh, E. coli cells through plasmid, okay. um, and from there we get have them express um, the, uh, the the plasmid enzyme of interest. Um, and then uh, do EDTA and Triton both um, are they known to uh, break up the cell wall as well as the cell membrane? Um, yeah, so they, they do help with that, but the the bigger thing is the homogenization, the high pressure homogenization right. unit. Um, they, they certainly, we, the way we were kind of going about this was we were trying to, to judge, you know, should we use sonication, should we use freeze thawing, should we use this and that, and from what we got, we figured that, you know, 
it'd be a high pressure homogenization is definitely for like for E. coli, like what we're using is definitely the go to. But to really squeeze the highest yield out of this process, you should be using some kind of chemical uh, reagents too, like the Tri-Anax and the ETA. Um, so like moral considerations aside, like the moral considerations being that you're in this industry to help people and you make this product and reduce blood loss and whatnot. Um, what's the financial justification for not just pursuing to sell plasma since you're getting so much more revenue from it, like twice the amount of revenue, right? So why wouldn't you just find just the financial speaking? What's the justification there? For not just selling plasma? Yeah, because you're selling the excess plasma, right? Which yes. Is more, uh, it's, it's creating more revenue, right? That's a good point. So there are a lot of manufacturers of plasmin out there. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit of a tough market to break. Whereas our coding business, I mean, we have one competitor, the Weiss Institute, but they're doing a very different approach than what we are. So really if we can get a greater market share with this business, which we hope to expand, whereas the plasmin business is already out there. I mean, we want to enter that market a little bit with you know applying our wholesale discount, but we believe you know, initially, yeah, our excess plasma sales may be a little bit more in revenue, but we leave going further. The medical device coding will be our principal business. Yeah, a lot of the numbers themselves were based off of um, the uh, the California market. Mm -hmm. um, they weren't scaled to the rest of the United States. Um, so when designing the original bioprocess plant, um, we were kind of going back and forth on what kind of scale we should be operating at. Um, and you know what kind of equipment to have in place for that. Um, so like if needed, you know we could always scale back. But we you know ended up doing the math and we were able to you know figure out well, what we can sell plasma to and offset the cost. But eventually, when the market grows larger, um, we could you know solely divert all our attention to coding the medical devices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah. uh, we, we get more money from that essentially. Mm -hmm. Um, with your <clears throat> return on investment of 66%, obviously that's an incredible number. Um, what do you think the largest, uh, I guess, problem is with um, this technology that has prevented other people from doing it already? Um, is something that you guys you know, have worked with in the past and done a lot of research on and think it's sort of novel, or is there something limiting, uh, or some sort of limitation? I mean, it is a fairly novel technology, at least what we're doing with it. But the reason why it's so profitable is because when you look at a medical stent, right, it's only 13 millimeters long, maybe like three millimeters in diameter. And our coatings are, it's like a tenth of a millimeter thick. So you only need a very small amount of this coating to do a device. And then if you're charging about $300 for that coating, and we're doing you know, 5.46 million of these devices a year, you know, we're only producing a small amount of coating, you know, I forget what it was, like 206 kilograms annually. So our actual production costs and raw materials are pretty low to actually produce that amount, but it can go a long way. Um, in addition to, like, off of what Nick said, um, we, did, we did talk about uh, the Weiss Institute a little bit um, and what they're kind of doing, and uh, they came up with some really interesting stuff. Um, similar idea, but it, it's not a mobilized plasma, it's kind of a coating that, you know, sort of lets things kind of slide by and not aggregate on it and, and you know, uh, and lack of scientific terms there. Um, but there was, when we were originally looking into this, um, just out of chance, like we you know, had the idea, I mean, we looked it up and uh, just a couple of years ago, um, there was some research um, mm -hmm. that uh, a group, um, I forget the university that it came out of, but they were doing something um, just, just like this, a mobilization of plasma on stainless steel. Um, and so they just published the research a few years ago, um, and you know it hasn't been scaled up yet. Yeah, yeah. it but was it was through the University of Sydney. Okay. So. Okay.